So first and foremost, I'll, I'll just mention the names and then I'm, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so we start, yeah, Doran. Uh, so as I mentioned, my role is uh, labeling technical communication and localization uh, for our products. Um, it's quite a big role. It covers a lot of aspects. Um, and localization is just a small part of it. And to be honest, I feel a little overwhelmed to be sitting here because uh, although I've been in the field for, of technical writing and content management and talking about the, uh, well, the source side of things for close to 25 years now, uh, localization side, although I was always involved somewhat, I only have become um, a key role uh, in the past uh, five years. And I'm not sure that <laughs> I have all the answers for uh, all the questions, but um, what I can say is that our focus uh, as a medical device company um, depends on what type of content is being delivered. Some of it is purely regulatory. Some of it is um, um, very helpful, safety oriented and requires a lot of detail to quality and content management and understanding and ICR processes and as we've discussed uh, in the morning in the, in the closer group. Um, and I think that for me that's, that's the focus for the coming year. Um, and of course the, the challenges are um, more, more language requirements, more localization requirements, but um, an expectation for shorter delivery times. And while maintaining the high quality of uh, localization, uh, even with the tools available today, it's quite a challenge. So yeah, my name is Nancy, I work at FedEx, um, but certainly I started four years and a half ago, uh, but when I started it was not FedEx, it was uh, TNT Express, also a logistics company, um, Dutch logistics company, uh, and when I started I already knew that FedEx was going to acquire TNT, which was a very exciting uh, moment, um, but we were at TNT, um, we were part of the digital department, so the TNT uh, CEO back then knew that in order to uh, be more attractive as a company, they needed to uh, have like a digital innovation or trans transformation movement, and that's where it all started, so we needed to redesign our website, redesign our applications, etc., work agile, all of that, and um, they needed to do that in 39 languages, uh, and they didn't have the speed to do it, the scale, so that's why they hired me back then, four and a half years ago. Uh, so we did that with TNT. Uh, we set up a localization program that was running nicely and smoothly, and then the FedEx acquisition became official, and then we <laughs> were playing uh, in a very different field. It's a huge company um, that is like, Lead, market lead in the US, uh, FedEx can not grow anymore in the US practically, so the growth of the company lies internationally. So uh, we need to make sure that FedEx actually grows outside of the US, which means obviously, uh, yeah, we need to be better at uh, uh, supporting different languages. Um, so by joining the company, we also learned that there was a sister team in the US that we have to work together. So this is where our team is right now. We have two teams, one based in the US and our team here in the Netherlands. And we're uh, little by little trying to uh, set up a, a program that can um, support uh, the enterprise uh, at, on a wider uh, spectrum. And this is an enterprise with 450,000 employees, <laughs> which is uh, uh, very, very uh, big. Uh, so yeah, stakeholder management and education, education, education is, uh, is our focus for sure. Well, uh, I'll start with a question. Is there anyone who doesn't know PayPal here? <laughs> Okay, good, then I don't have to introduce the company. It was a joke. Yeah, that was the fun part. No, it wasn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I joined PayPal a little over three years ago. And it's actually my third role at PayPal. I joined to lead the regional effort in EMEA to get us closer to the stakeholders, all the stakeholders that we have in the region. And I worked in that area for probably a year and a half, and then I moved on to lead a new team because we were making a data-oriented push in localization. Uh, and 
I headed the data team or analytics team, we could call that within localization. Uh, and then because we were making another change, we wanted to scale up our systems. Uh, we wanted to make sure we are repeatable in our processes. We get the speed, we get the quality. Uh, and of course, we do it with the same money that we used to have. So we decided to put a lot more focus on technology. And because I've always been a tech nerd, um, I was put in charge of that team in June last year. So it's been a couple of months only, but we're making good progress there. Does the fun fact come now or later? <laughs> okay, so the fun fact is not really a fun fact or a funny fact, right? Uh, I guess a lot of us have had a moment or a couple of moments, if, you know, working in the language industry for a long, long time, that we felt, oh, I've had enough, right? <laughs> right, I've had enough, I want to go anywhere, I want to like dig holes, whatever, right? Uh, and, and around, actually June this year, I got a glorious opportunity without leaving the company, without making a lot of changes to my private life, to leave this industry. And you know what I realized? I guess you can guess, right, because I'm here, that I don't want to, right? So that's the not so funny fact, but it's, but it's really important for my life. Uh, my name is Miruna. I'm the localization program manager at Box. Uh, Box is a uh, fintech scale-up now. Um, I've been in the localization industry two and a half years. It's when I got the position at Box to create a program from scratch. I was new to it. Uh, Box was new to it, so challenges were on all levels. Um, figure out what needs to be done so we can scale across several countries and nine languages and while tackling all the issues of a startup at the time. Um, I think that my challenges are still uh, very different from, from the challenges of my peers here um, because the scale is very different. Um, my focus for this year is continuing to grow the program. Um, getting more people that have a say into what we're doing, a seat at the table. Um, I liked how Lucio um, phrased it, so getting more people closer to uh, empower more people to, to have a say. By my people, I say people that are not, you know, necessarily development or product, but, you know, translators, content writers, um, which would mean that it would lead to um, us being able to embed the localization uh, program into the actual development process. So this is still uh, the type of challenges we are struggling with, so, yeah. but. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, what, what technologies are you gonna be focusing on? Are you testing new technologies? Are, are you implementing? What are you, the expected outcomes in, in any of those technologies um, this, this year for 2020? So, from the localization perspective, uh, and it's not only PayPal, I've actually noticed this at, at a couple companies. Uh, approximately, I don't want to say same size, but with similar challenges. Uh, we're really making a big push towards redefining the uh, quality side of our operations. So we're looking into systems, into technologies that make it easier for us to connect data analysis and, and sort of the business side of the house, the customer behavior patterns, the, uh, uh, the customer feedback that flows in through all the various channels to connect that to the deliverables from localization so that we can do our job better, so that we actually know what impact we make with our localized content, rather than just assume we're making a great content because everything that we write is linguistically perfect. That, I would say, is gonna be the big push, not only for us as a company, but like for the whole industry in the coming years. So, measuring ROI? Well, ROI is part of that. There are more KPIs than just yeah. ROIs, right? Uh, depending on the industry, you might have a lot of uh, customer uh, metrics, churns, uh, activations. You might have uh, operational KPIs around uh, the number of interactions with, with, uh, with customer support, right? So all of that needs to be fed into our systems and only that way uh, a lot of the players in the industry will eventually end up measuring the quality of localization. So ROI is a part of that too, of course. Uh, yeah, so uh, we 
implemented and translation management system uh, relatively recently, uh, three years ago for uh, TNT and two years ago for FedEx. It's the same, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> uh, I did some influencing in there, but uh, but uh, because obviously when you implement a choose and TMS, a TMS, it's a big decision in, in such a big company because you need to make sure that the TMS uh, is uh, compatible with everything, uh, with all the systems in your company. You have to like make connections, APIs, all of that, and once you're there, it's like, I think worse than a marriage, it's easier to get a divorce than to <laughs> decouple yourself from a TMS. So you really need, it is, it's a, so that's what I say, like we've been with the TMS for three years, so I don't, I don't think that we're gonna change that part, uh, unless, <laughs> uh, it's because we are married to the same, we're married to the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's an well, interesting so. fun fact. <laughs> Um, but uh, certainly, uh, machine translation will will for sure uh, be uh, starting to to start to start experimenting with it. Uh, in a company so large, um, it it is impossible for for us to keep up. Uh, and since we have now a team in two, uh, two teams in two countries, we have like the tooling. There are like our partners. More and more people are coming to us, going like, "Hey, I, I know that you guys are doing like translations in a very smooth way. Can you help us?" So more and more stakeholders from the company come to us and it's like, okay, I mean, if you keep on growing, growing, there is no way that we can actually uh, service everyone. So T at MT is going to be uh, for sure a part of our experimentation. Well, experimentation. <laughs> I think it's going to be like implemented. Um, and uh, that's going to be uh, quite, quite a big thing for us, um, especially because... Um, we do a lot of marketing, uh, but I'm pretty sure that MT can help us a lot, even on that side. So we're going to make it happen. Um, so for highly regulated uh, companies and um, industries, uh, there's a lot of work to be done besides the uh, ROIs and business values when implementing systems. Uh, the amount of loops I have to jump through in order to get uh, a new software upgrade approved uh, is uh, uh, you know gives you a headache just to, just to think about it. Um, so um, we're a little slower in the implementation of new technology and new uh, systems for obvious reasons. Um, we're looking at a global level, uh, Johnson and Johnson level, to maybe create a translation management hub for all of Johnson and Johnson. Uh, if that doesn't work, then hopefully I'll be able to at least set it up in our uh, uh, regional offices. That's one of the discussions. Uh, but we're focusing on um, whatever software we can that can help us uh, that we can rush through. So another one of the aspects is improving the internalization of um, the source content through use of content management systems. Um, improved uh, linguists, so we're looking into uh, um, products in a company called Acrolinks, I don't know if you're familiar with, that helps with uh, focusing the content across, uh, across the board. Um, so we do what we can in order to, you know, with the tools that we can uh, and the limitations that we have to try and improve the process both from the source language and the localized language. Um, and yes, machine translation is something that we would want to implement at least at some levels. Um, we do a little bit of um, customer complaints through machine translations, basically into English rather than the other way around, uh, just to better understand uh, the complaints and not just uh, have, because um, again, highly regulated, a complaint comes in, we have to give a response within a couple of working days. Uh, we need to understand what the actual complaint is, and if it comes from Japan or China and the group is sitting in uh, Juarez or Israel, it's a little difficult. Um, so we're looking into that. Uh, for the actual content going to the customers, I don't think we're there this year. Um, I have seen, I have been following up on, and I have been seeing a lot of uh, leaps in neural machine translation quality. Uh, but I don't think our, our you know, at least medical device industry is ready for it yet. Very interesting.
interesting. And Miruna, I, I'm just wondering what, what is going to be the focus um, for, uh, sorry, the, the technologies that you might be testing this year? We, um, we don't look into machine translation for now. Uh, we get our information, of course, we dabble with it, but it's not something that we will be looking into this year. I don't think we're ready for that, and there's also no need, per se. Um, what are, we are looking into is better tooling, um, better CAD tools. You know, for, I've, been busy, I've been busy for the last year trying to uh, influence people to move to a more performant tool that will give, give us more control over our content. Uh, we're looking into how to better do our testing, you know, how to, we can automize and move away from the manual testing that we're doing for localization, you know, set up, uh, you know, some automate, automized flows that will give, give us a better overview of what we have and how we can improve what we have, not only in terms of language, but, you know, in terms of user experience. Um, what I am in discussion now is, because at Box we care a lot about user experience, that's all we talk about all day, it's UX, UX. Uh, we do a lot of testing for, um, with English content, right, A-B test, and we are so open to, you know, create two versions of the app and of, of a certain feature and say, oh, this performed better than the other. But we don't look into that for, for, for localization, which is such a shame, because it's an opportunity to move away from all the very, painful discussions that we have sometimes over three words mm -hmm. and and to make such um, in the end uninformed decisions because it's very preferential it doesn't really matter what we think of word x it's all about what our users want and they dictate in the end the lingo they dictate the um, so they dictate actually what we develop on a functionality level, on a feature level, but I think they also dictate how we should write and how we should translate, how we should localize. So I would like us to experiment this. I think this would be an enormous source of, of, of knowledge uh, to improve our quality. So um, these are the small steps I think that we can take before looking uh, for this type of uh, company where I'm now uh, working, before looking into more advanced tooling. I think it's... Uh, uh, yeah, it would be too, too much of a stretch. So, yeah, especially because we put so much input in agility, uh, sorry, emphasis on agility and, you know, sorry. And, and I know you and I have spoken about kind of, you know, user experience and localization, like, and they can't really, should be not considered separate and, and they kind of go hand in hand. So it's probably one of the missing links in the industry, uh, in, in my opinion, and I think there's, there's other people in the room who, who would agree with that. What, what else is missing in the industry? Like what, what not, not from a tools or perhaps from a tools perspective, but, but what, uh, you know, from your perspective, what is it that the industry is still missing that is in, in uh, you know, absolute dare need um, to, to have? From a, be it from a, uh, I don't know, be it from a technology point of view, obviously, or, or perhaps from a, I don't know, from a linguistic point of view or from a process point of view, or what are the missing links in the industry at the minute? I mean, the still measuring quality of translations is a super subjective uh, process right now. We uh, rely on uh, in-country reviewers or in uh, external parties, or all of them are linguists, but all of them are looking inside, and what you said is absolutely true. Companies focus, some companies, not mine, <laughs> on A-B testing what, what works better, and this, um, uh, this uh, CTA is better than this one, but only in English. Uh, very few companies actually have done it very well multilingually. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of them, but that's because that's their DNA, right? So having uh, the ability of uh, doing more tests in terms of language, like uh, tools that, that allow this in an easy way, because it's not easy either to have an A-B testing uh, in all of the languages uh, at the same time. You really need um, tools that support that. Um, and then also like the things that you said, like, okay, customer, customer service calls are super important, right? Like, uh, all companies right now are, uh, they want less calls, right? They want less calls to their customer support. So that means that the information that is online should be clear enough that as a customer, I go there at the FAQs and I can find what I'm looking for. Is that actually working? Is, actually, is there a correlation between the two? 
there's still not a way. Uh, it's very difficult to measure that, or at least in big companies like ours, it's incredibly difficult to, um, to have that put together because it was not how the company started off. Like, the company started off as a huge open, uh, operational company, and now it's like, okay, we need to measure everything. And uh, we simply are not wired to, to do that. Uh, and like working in, in retrospective is always uh, much more difficult. And so that, uh, that little problem you're having as a startup is actually a luxury problem because you are able to influence it from the beginning. I would just like to add to what you've said, Nancy. Uh, so it is the quality thing. And overall, <clears throat> a data thing. I, I think what the industry really lacks still is is the ability to sit down as a partner with all the stakeholders, the business people, business development, sales, uh, marketing, others, right, who basically bring in the company, bring in the money, right, bring in the revenues, and actually talk KPIs, talk goals, right? Be able to demonstrate clearly how we, what it is that we bring to the table, what it is that we add, how do we contribute. Uh, because if you think about it, ultimately that money that localization gets has been taken away from somewhere else. It could have been spent on marketing campaigns, it could have been spent on product. It could have, I, I, know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, you, we're all aware of that, right? But the industry still has not solved that. There are like islands here and there. Some companies do try to tackle this. Some companies instrument their products better if we're talking about online products, for example, to actually bring in the data to get and analyze it so that localization can use it as well. But in others, it's very ad hoc. And it's usually in these others where localization struggles a lot. It's usually in these others where localization cannot uh, demonstrate its value to the company. It, it's, 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 it's in these other companies that a lot of layoffs, reorganizations within localization happen because it's always an afterthought. All right, no, mon no money for localization, what is it giving us anyway, right? Let's just fire maybe somebody, right? The industry must learn to be a strategic partner there, and it must be armed with data at that table. Anything to add, Doran or Miruna, to that, in terms of what you feel is missing in the industry? I think there's sometimes a lack of awareness of the importance of the people that are on the other side of the screen. We don't give them a voice, we don't give them a name, and we don't give them a face, because why would we? So these are also the people that I think should sit at the table bring them closer. I mean, it's not always possible but to involve them from the beginning, but some, there are some disruptors, you know. There's an example I always give and that I admire a lot that have managed to not talk about translation anymore, but about UX copywriting in every language. That means that you, that's actual localization the way I see it. When you really create a product from scratch and you don't go from a base language, which is mostly English, um, so, okay, we can't all, all do that. It's not always possible. It's a complex process and not for every type of content. But at least we can, you know, empower more those people um, that are on the other side of the screen and they're just writing the words and they have to chop, chop, deliver. I think we also have to change, find new models to, to pay those people. I have a lot of empathy and respect for what my team of, uh, I like to call them, uh, language and cultural specialists do and uh, paying them by words and trying to always push the price down is, is ridiculous. I really think we are beyond that. We should think beyond that because, I mean, people need incentives. People need to feel that they're part of the team and they're rewarded for their effort and their efforts are pretty important and we wouldn't be anywhere without them. So oh, that's what I feel that we should work on, you know, we always talk about, you know, all these technologies and all these, you know, we have these big plans, but whereas we should really work on the human side of the business, I think we could, uh, we would all have a lot to gain. Uh, obviously, big companies need technology, otherwise we can't uh, cater. Uh, and that's it's, it's a vital part of any localization program, so we cannot forget that. But uh, you know, every day, me and my team are always telling people that our TMS is not the is not the 
the, it's not who, what does the translation. People really think I just push the button and it comes on the other side, and it's like okay, uh, it's not it's not the tool. It's actually there are people behind it, and, and more than one. So I always have this visualization of it about like 39 languages require 150 people uh, to 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 deliver something. So it's it's uh, it's it's finding the right balance because obviously if you go to a big company to a board. Uh, you're going to say, oh, but these people need to be paid more. People are going to laugh at you, obviously, because it's like, no, no, we have this money. Uh, so you need even to find... In, a, even in small companies. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's like, that's a reality. You, you have budgets, and, and you need to, indeed, uh, demonstrate or, or uh, position yourself as strategic uh, partners, which is uh, easier say, said than done. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're always like the localization people, the translation people. Yeah. <laughs> or, the that, tool name, data, or the right? tool name people. We need to demonstrate through data. Yeah, exactly. The value. And, and, and how to do it. Because people say, well, if we, if we don't translate into Polish, we don't sell in Poland. Well, duh. But, <laughs> but how do you demonstrate it? Like, what your value is, 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 is really, well, I don't know. If someone has a good metric that you have uh, used uh, and that people have bought into it, just please let us know because... <laughs> There is a way, right? So, so my firm belief is this. Uh, a real translator, a real localizer, prides her or himself in the quality of what she or he delivers. Sorry for the she or he, I try to be inclusive. Um, and the only reason a lot of the additional quality assurance in our industry needs to happen is because the industry has essentially allowed itself to be pushed into the corner by the really big players of yesterday and today as well, the Microsofts and the others, right? Squeezing the rates, squeezing the margins. And of course, at the end of it, there is always the translator who is essentially getting paid peanuts, right? So there is a way to buck this trend. We have, we made a big bet uh, last year, essentially, to actually give more time to the translation vendors to stop squeezing the rates and in return ask for quality. We figured if, if you know, like product organizations are used to time boxing development and they've managed to convince everyone that you don't, like, you cannot ship good code within one day from request, right? the stakeholders should also be open to discussing this as far as linguistics are concerned. And guess what? They are open to that. If you frame it right, and if you back it with data, sorry, that's my part, right? Uh, so essentially, what happened is we made a bet, stop doing continuous translation, unless it's really, really needed for something, but that's very seldom the case. Uh, give translation vendors the time. Uh, give them enough money to pay the translators well so that they don't have to do like 6,000 6, words a day just to keep their families fed, right? And in return, we're betting that we're gonna get quality, right? In return, we're betting that we're gonna get quality. I'll repeat that because we don't want to do all that quality assurance downstream post factum, right? Just get it right the first time. So far, I believe it's working Perfectly, we'll see how it goes. You know, as we as we go along with this new model. Like, how how do you approach this? How do you get people to? I mean, you said you can get them to agree, obviously through education. But is it is it like when you look at the overall timeline? It's like you know, put your eggs here and your time here at the beginning, and and you know, or or just just I guess you know maybe it sounds simplistic, but I mean, and I know Doron that the time to market is certainly one of one of your biggest challenges. So I'm just curious to see what your thoughts are on that. Uh, like I said, for us, um, so for the <laughs> hardware devices that have a lengthy um, testing cycle, then time to market for the localization is not a problem. For the software side of things, when uh, they're expecting things to happen sort of agilely, uh, but still com comply with all the regulations and the requirements and the quality requirements, um, that takes time. And you can't shorten the the physical time it takes. You can only maybe um, start earlier, 
develop more processes so the streaming will be faster. Um, obviously, you know, we're all in agreement. We're not going to squeeze the translator do work quickly because uh, otherwise we're going to pay for it in time afterwards. For Three corrections. times as much. Yeah, at least. At least. Um, but um, but that, that is where technology comes in because if we can streamline the processes faster, not the actual work, but um, if we're talking about content management system and publication, and if uh, depending on the way that uh, the review is being done and how the process is being managed, those are the places that we can save time. And like I said, maybe at some point, yes, machine translation will be able to save time, we'll be able to pay more by the hour instead of by the word and um, get more words done at a shorter period of time without losing the, the translator's trust and the ability to bring bread to, to his family, like you said. You were going to say something? So, so we, we manage like a lot of uh, different types of content, but mostly it's marketing or uh, applications, so our customers can book uh, shippings uh, through the website or uh, trace their, their packages, so there are a couple of applications. with it. So we have marketing and applications and then the corporate content, let's say. But uh, for marketing, we kind of lose hope in the sense that there's always a time crunch. Like, they think of the campaign, the campaign has a launch date, there are so many delays during the production um, uh, period of the, of the campaign, like uh, approvals, drafts, uh, you name it, agencies are late, whatever, and then when it arrives to us, well, guess what, I promised you three weeks, but you only have one. Uh, because the, the launch date of the marketing is not moving. But, so that, that requires a lot of education and uh, uh, talking to marketing. Actually, the marketing department now is uh, aware that this cannot continue like this because the regional people are complaining about it. So that's actually <laughs> pretty good. So that's like the lost cause, let's say. Like, okay, this is marketing, and I think everyone that does marketing has the same... Uh, same uh, Challenges, <laughs> not to call it problem. Uh, but then we have the, the, the product teams that develop our uh, applications, and we have a mix there between uh, old fashioned waterfall and software, and then we have like teams that work completely agile. And that's, uh, that was our challenge like, how to cater ag agile teams because you know, delivering continuously can be tricky, but we cannot just say no because then the developers are going to get nervous. So we, had, we had to uh, find a way, and uh, for the TNT. Uh, express um, applications we're actually doing continuous delivery so every two days or something there is something dropping in the pipeline the agency picks it up delivers it but in order to do that we had to have the right tool that mm, talk to github uh, a tool that actually shows the context like how the, 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 the application will look like that helps a lot everyone doing everything instead <coughs> of a, a excel sheet with everything so that 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 really helps a lot and we we do it like uh, twice a week we deliver uh, uh, new features uh, for our applications for our agile team but it, it does uh, take the right tools again uh, that actually support it um, that give context to the translators and to reviewers so it's extremely important uh, 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 agreement with your with your uh, LSP also important about rates for example like, uh, obviously, if I, I'm sending uh, 10 words twice a week, uh, I'm not going to pay minimum rate every time. <laughs> so we need to agree, okay, how we're going to invoice this. So it's, 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 it's possible, but it, it requires like an understanding and expectations with stakeholders, developers, uh, your, part your partners, etc. Do you really see anything different for this year in terms of challenges or is it just kind of keep working on the same challenges that perhaps you know you've been working on for, for a number of, of years or at least for a few months the same challenges but are becoming more and more um, because of the language requirements so it's not a different challenge it's just becoming a little more uh, a little bit, bit more of a problem we have very basic stuff like um, stakeholder management, people who don't understand that translating something into 20 languages takes time and people. Um, and that, you know, if you have a beautiful design on your website and like just a little button, you know, when it's translated into Finnish, it's not going to fit. So this is every, our everyday, like I would say 90% of my day is explaining this to people. 
And then we are worried about artificial intelligence, really? Is it, is it that our, like, <laughs> is, it, is it really? Like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried at all about this. I mean, like, these are, like, most of our problems are now talking to humans and making them understand what we're doing. So artificial intelligence is only good for us because it actually takes care of things that, who wants to be in a project management position, like, constantly pushing files, like Excel sheets, and nobody wants to do that. So. I mean, stop worrying about AI. I would agree and disagree slightly. So the AI, and, and you know, we're now deep into neural and, 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 and these things, and, and, and there is exponential growth in the capabilities of all the systems that, that are in place because the amount of data is exploding, and that's what feeds, that's what oils the, the, the systems, right? But the unexpected challenge related to this is actually that as more and more AI-based intelligence and analysis becomes available, the more and more focus there is on localization, on vendors, on, on, on uh, buyer side teams, to be able to, to provide good analysis, quality analysis. Back in the day, a translator was a translator. What I would need now is a translator who is able to actually not only translate, but also interpret data for me interpret customer feedback, right? See how it impacts all these beautiful charts, talk statistics a little, because hey, I, I speak Polish and, and, and a couple of other languages, but I don't speak all of them, naturally, right? And, and none of the data people that I know speak all the languages in the world. We need the industry's help, the vendor's help, the translator's help to interpret this for us. And I don't think a lot of the organizations out there in the industry are ready to handle this. Very interesting. No, Any, because that would mean that you have to redefine the role of that translator. Well, <coughs> if it goes away yeah, with the AI. Which is, yeah. Yeah. Or the regional project manager. It yeah. doesn't necessarily need to be the translator. Yeah, but then it's also a shift in mindset, right? How you regard those people and what type of responsibilities you put on their plate. It's, it's, it's a set of things that we need to achieve. And before that, I mean, I, I agree with, with, with Nancy, is, is we have to bring localization in terms of awareness at the same level as development or marketing or product, you know. So people understand that if that code is not ready, you know, that's fine, okay, we, we're just not going to ship, but if that translation is not ready, it's okay, or it's, it's a big deal, you know. If So kind of, you know, regard, bring localization to a better awareness, to a better level of awareness uh, and then everything I think will fall into place or more. What was the continuous translation and what do you do instead like what content type was it or, or, or in what sense did you mean continuous translation? Well, continuous translation was less about getting uh, disconnected strings just flowing in it was more about getting translation jobs at random times in random volumes or so it seems if you work with hundreds of different stakeholders, right? And, and basically developing according to an SLA that said, you know, this is how fast we're going to deliver every job based on its volume, right? Instead what we're doing and what we've agreed with vast majority of our stakeholders is we're going to time box the stuff and you give us a week to translate. And then you get good quality and you're sure you're not impacted downstream when you start releasing. Now, we don't, really <clears throat> sorry, we don't really work on marketing, so that makes it easier, right? But it's about basically everything else. It's about uh, software UI, it's about uh, uh, product web pages, it's about uh, legal stuff, which is very regulated in, that, in, in the fintech industry, in the financial industry, it's about uh, support content. So the volumes are huge, but it's basically time boxed. And the stakeholders do like it because most of them in the past were hit at some stage or another by actually having to do rework with us because something went horribly wrong and we mistranslated something massively and, and, and we just had to fix it, right? For them, the impact is every bit as big as for us because everything we change, they need to retest. And that's essentially what we did. And is it like according to volume or like type of we do We do have capacity uh, that we sort of like top capacity for every language. Everyone knows that we do have this capacity. And, and at a certain moment in time, we'll just say no, right? 
unless something is really critical and urgent, then we always have a backup plan for that. Then we work more in a, at, on an ad hoc basis, but also with specialized dedicated resources that we've handpicked. Uh, it doesn't happen that often though, right? The good thing is we actually had the data to analyze this and to prepare for this and to know more or less what we need or how much capacity we need per language to be able to deliver probably 90% of the stuff that we need to deliver. Um, not necessarily a question, but maybe more to add to a challenge that I do actually see from a content creation point of view, is that there is a clear change in needs with uh, the digital environment and everyone having so much information at their fingertips and everyone basically becoming an expert on everything means that the translator role as it used to be with just translating whatever you get in language is not really so relevant anymore in, in the day-to-day, -day, at least that we see that we do. So it's, it's a clear challenge that we see if the translator role could potentially actually be um, changing into machine translations, but then how do we actually upskill the translators that we currently have into a more creative role where they actually become more reactive and they can uh, start creating content based on a similar brief that um, the English source writing is using as well. And I think that is something that we see very clearly that the role of translators is changing because a simple one-to-one -one translation doesn't really exist in this world anymore. Uh, you really clearly need experts in, in every field and that is not, I mean, I see it in my team with copywriters. We actually look at the job and we get the right person in. So whether it's something for football, we get someone in who's a football fan, a football player. And the same thing we need in translations, which is not something that we currently have as a setup. So I do see a clear challenge. Um, and also with reacting to certain situations that happen in the world, which is something that with the lead times that we have, um, we're being squeezed on a content creation point of view. And the same thing is going to happen in translations more and more. We need to be actually able to react right away, right there and then, and being able to upload content like, on a regular basis, because that's what people are expecting. Uh, on the side of creative translations, you'd certainly, I, I, I would love to get like a brief, like for like the same brief that the agency uh, gets and then start from scratch even without source, you know, like that would be awesome. But yeah, that if it, again, you, you come in with a budget and it's like <laughs> too expensive. Um, that's, that's, but that's absolutely, I think that I, I see more and more trans creators going to that. I mean, like it's, it's, it's a thing, it's not, I mean, it's, it has been happening for years. But what you said is actually super interesting about uh, data, so someone who actually, um, <coughs> Uh, analyzes, okay, this is a translation, uh, how many visitors is this getting, how can I tweak it to make it more, like someone more like a UX writer who, who actually tweaks things here and there to uh, make it more, uh, yeah, <laughs> more appealable and, and ultimately brings more money. So there's a creative side, of, of course, but there's also the practical side of things. Uh, and there are a few companies that do it, and I mean, there is a big... Uh, digital company where you book your hotels in the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> Same names, but they are they they do a, a great job with this because their the language specialists are also like doing maybe tests, uh, writing down things. Like it's, I mean, there are a couple of them that were employees over here, so you can ask them how how it was to work there. But like one of these, this one of the responsibilities they get as a language specialist is also owning that part, like um, making sure that. Uh, your copy or your translation uh, works in, in, your, in your country in terms of uh, bringing more money. Yeah, and I think when you talk about budgets, though, the, the thing is that we can make clear efficiencies by using machine writing, by using the right tools and not seeing it as a threat, but actually seeing it as an opportunity to focus the effort on where it should be focused on. Because machine writing, I mean, everything that a machine can do is not necessarily what's interesting for linguists. It's actually bringing that nuance to language. Exactly, which and, and it's, it's really funny how... how uh, uh, we, we have like uh, oh this this translation this campaign to translate this campaign is gonna cost x amount of euros but that's actually what uh, I'm gonna pay my LSP but we don't know how much money actually people this is costing because our in our um, in our company we have ICR in control review especially for marketing com uh, content and that is so time consuming that the amount if we can quantify the amount of money this cost it will be 
insane. Like, why are we doing this? But still, there are so many companies uh, with this uh, model in which uh, uh, LSP translation, translates the marketing and then it goes to ICR and then it gets there for days and hours and days and making changes that nobody knows why. And when you ask the, the, the people, why are you making so many changes? Oh, it's because it sounds better preferential. So it's, 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 it is still like, I, I agree. Uh, I, I think it's, it would be cheaper, but uh, it, it's still a perception and also there is the politics part. Like uh, the regional offices want to feel that they have a say in on the translation, et cetera, et cetera. So. You were talking about how you actually chose a, an, another TMS last year. Well, we're basically in the same kind of process right now, evaluating tools. What for you were the deciding factors or criteria on which you based your choice? A um, couple of them. Uh, compatibility with our um, system, CMS, uh, co uh, code repositories, uh, etc. So it needed to be like really automated. No, no one wants to upload a file on a TMS, of course. <laughs> Um, uh, it needs to be. It needed to be like user friendly because our uh, colleagues uh, everywhere in the world need to access it to do the in country review, <laughs> the infamous in country, in country review. So it needed to be uh, user friendly. Lots of these uh, tools are very clunky and stuck in <laughs> 20 years ago. Uh, it needed to be that and uh, the uh, contextual view. So we wanted a tool that actually show how the translation will look like in the application, on the website, on the email. Uh, so that was those were the three criteria. Not the money, which is yeah. no, no, yeah. no. I, I was That's very lucky. Obvious, right? I was very lucky. I was yeah. like there was no limit there. So 